I'm David Ofosido, I'm senior partner at ABN David Africa. I mean, uh, my everyday life, I have a family. Uh, I'm a family, very much a family man. I like people around me uh, at home. I am a very passionate Pan-Africanist, so I'm an executive of an organization called Afro Champions. Uh, and we look at how to transform Africa from a private sector perspective. For me, each moment defines what the vision is. So over the last 10 years or so, I've been focusing on a Pan-African vision for the firm itself. I mean, apart from my private life in terms of the firm being able to move from an ordinary, uh, normal, practice where you are focused in one country to a Pan-African practice where you are international and the first part that keeps me going are the things I love. I 90% of the things I do are things I love. The other 10% which doesn't contradict interestingly are the things I hate. I seek to pursue the things I love and to change the things I hate and I actually hate the idea and, and I say this a bit sincerely. I hate the idea of Africa not being significant and whatever I can do from wherever I sit to help it to be significant in my own little corner, that's what I do and I'm very, very passionate about it. An attempt to create a Pan-African practice is not an easy one. And I tell people that like, if you can create a Pan-African practice of a law firm, you can do it for almost everything. Because every country in Africa actually has laws which prevents non, uh, pe people who are not qualified in the jurisdiction from practicing there. So I've been asked several times how I've done it. You have to find ways of going around it to let it be that the firm is practiced, is, I mean, the practice by only those who are within that jurisdiction, but never, nevertheless part of the Pan-African group. And that's what we, we've done. So it depends on your vision. If your vision is big and it's challenging, for me, the more challenging it is, the more reason why you must do something about it every day. If you do something about it every day, that spares you to do that little thing the next day. And very soon you will see that what appeared to be very big uh, or very difficult uh, begins to shape up. And then you have more uh, energy and room to continue. So my understanding of the bold new normal as Lucy Quist propounded it, and uh, I happened to be one of the people she spoke to in, in, in shaping uh, when she was writing, writing the book, uh, is very, very achievable, uh, or I should say more than achievable. Uh, but People have doubts about this ability to achieve because many people don't recognize there are two separate Africas. And, and I've been talking about that and explaining it to a lot of people lately. There is Africa which consists of a lot of very bold people and who are transforming the continent in their own ways. I'm one of them. I, I have transformed the law firm from a, a table I couldn't pay for. I, I borrowed a table that started this law firm with two people to a law firm which is among the largest law firms in Africa and in six countries. So I, I've told you that. So this is achievable. They are youth entrepreneurs doing wonderful things. There are many, many of that. That is a new Africa. But there's another Africa which is the one which occupies the news. That Africa consists of our leaders, especially the political leaders, who keep doing the wrong things. That unfortunately is the one which you see on BBC and CNN and international media. And people confuse those two Africa because Africa is because we judge the Africa by the ones who are prominent to occupy the news. That real Africa is there, and from that Africa, I think it is far achievable. One of two things will happen: it's either our leaders are going to change and recognize the new Africa so the whole world recognizes it and the momentum will be guarded or we are going to push them I mean in a way that they will become less relevant I think it's achievable a lot of things are happening in Africa digitization AFC FTA uh, name all the things happening around the world what will happen is that because of what ordinary people are doing these things will converge and that convergence will create a new normal and it is already happening unnoticed. So, so that's how I see it. Institutions must do only one of two things. They must either shape behavior or they must use the behavior of the people to cause change. And our institutions are not designed to do either of the two. And I, I once tweeted that we plan our economies as if everybody grabs coffee on his way to work. When people are eating Eba or uh, in Chima in, in, in Zambia or Waje in Ghana, and, and, and this may sound funny, but this actually determines how people behave. My final words are that things like bold new normal should continue and we should keep spreading the message that we can do it. We should defy so-called tradition. 
and do the things that they think are not capable of being done. Because at the end of the day, whatever is existing today, is existing because somebody challenged the status quo then. Until we don't, until we challenge the status quo as it is now, things will just continue getting worse. They will continue deteriorating. We have to just create new things. And we do it from wherever we find ourselves. We, we don't have to be... Look, I get asked the question all the time. Are you contesting political leadership? No. I think one of the fastest ways to lead your community astray is to join politics. You can actually make a change faster outside politics than inside politics. So people must understand that wherever they find themselves, they can make a change. You are actually making that change where you are. If you have to wait to have political leadership to make a change, then it means you cannot make a change. You should make the change from where you are. Then you may be trusted into political leadership. <music>